Chapter 17 out of your Warner Hisley, The Physiological Transition of the Newborn. So the respiratory system. So as the fetus approaches term, um, they have this intrapulmonary fluid that is going to reduce the pulmonary resistance to blood flow. And then it's going to facilitate that initiation of air breathing when the fetus comes out. And we need this initiation of respirations because it's the first step in the neonatal transition. Um, about 34 to 36 weeks, the um, lung expansion will stimulate the release um, of the production of surfactant. And surfactant is needed because it decreases the surface tension with alveoli. The problem is when babies are preterm, you know, before this 34 to 36 week period, um, when they're born, they're born without that surfactant. And so for these preemies, they administer a medication called betamethasone, and this stimulates lung development in the premature um, infant to improve respiratory functioning. Um, the first breath, there is internal and external stimuli that help initiate this first breath. There's, so internally, there's these chemical factors. So um, acidosis, hypoxia, um, hypercarbia, and then that combination with the stress from the stress on the baby from childbirth will help stimulate that first breath. Then you have the external stimuli, the sensory and thermal factors, so um, their temperature and everything that's going on around them, and then the mechanical factors. This is um, when the baby is pushed through that birthing canal, it compresses their lungs, and that helps push some of that fluid out. So then recoil then causes them to breathe. So the cardiopulmonary transitions, um, the fetus will have an increased pulmonary blood volume and then we're converting from the fetal to the neonatal circulation. Um, right away you need to make sure that you're doing those APGAR scores, looking at the baby's skin color, respiratory rate, breathing pattern. So like I said we're going from the fetal to neonatal circulation so um, the foramen, um, oval, the ductus arteriosus, and the ductus venosus is closing. Um, they're gonna, the neonate's gonna have an increased um, systemic pressure and decreased pulmonary pressure, and then an increased aortic pressure and decreased venous pressure. So again, making sure you assess. Um, you assess the pulse. It should be 120 to 160 beats per minute is normal. Um, that you're looking at the cap refill. So um, below three seconds is adequate, but if it's longer than that, there could be a problem. Thermogenic adaptation. So you want a neutral thermal environment um, because it could initiate cold stress. And some of the risk factors for cold stress is like a large body surface area, um, limited subcutaneous fat. Um, the neonate will have a limited ability to shiver. And they have thin skins, and the blood vessels are close to the surface. So we're going to want to keep baby warm. But there are adaptations that the baby has to increase heat production. Like they have um, an increased uh, metabolic rate and um, the muscle activity. So when they're flailing around, that's going to produce heat. Um, and then they have what we call brown adipose tissue. And it's tissue, like some fat tissue, that's going to um, keep in that heat. So some mechanisms for heat loss through evapor evaporation, um, you know, with water loss, conduction, conve convection, and radiation. So 
So we can use, um, you know, like heat lamps, wrap the baby in blankets, um, put on a little hat so they don't lose that heat through their um, head. But we want to make sure that we're not inducing um, hyperthermia. So hematopoietic adaptation. So um, the baby's blood volume is going to actually come from the cord, and it's going to depend on um, how long the physician waits before cutting the cord. Um, you know, the physician can wait, but the longer they wait, the increased risk for jaundice because the baby's getting more red blood cells. So some of the blood components. Um, the baby's erythrocytes and hemoglobin, so they're going to have increased levels, um, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and erythrocytes. Um, their leukocytes, or WBCs, are going to be increased just for the first 12 hours, and this is normal, so don't be alarmed when you see those increased rates. Um, and then platelets. Right away, the baby needs a vitamin K shot because if they don't get that vitamin K shot, they can develop a, a clotting deficiency. Hepatic adaptation, so the baby's metabolic rate is increased, therefore their glucose stores deplete quicker. Um, if, if the mother chooses to breastfeed, um, the baby will have an adequate supply of iron, um, but if they do not then, and they choose to formula feed, the baby needs iron fortified formula. Um, a risk um, is jaundice. Um, there's just a risk that the baby might have it. Um, it's not always, um, you know, caused by a pathologic cause. Um, but the baby is at risk for developing jaundice because, um, well, jaundice is caused by high um, bilirubin, um, bilirubin levels, um, anything above three milligrams per deciliter. And the increased bilirubin levels happen because um, the baby has, remember I talked about the baby has more red blood cells, and if, they, if the physician chooses to let the cord pulsate for longer, then they're going to get more from, uh, from the mom. And the red blood cell life span is shortened. And what happens is there's a normal, so normally, um, there's a breakdown of, uh, of the hemoglobin and that's, that's where, um, and it breaks it down into like iron and carbon monoxide and that's where we get the bilirubin levels. So then what happens with physiologic um, jaundice is it appears the first 24 to 48 hours after birth. Um, it's transient. The pathologic will be present at birth or within that first 24 hours. Um, the breastfeeding jaundice will appear um, day two to day four. And this is because they have an increase in breast milk intake, but then they're not having that meconium passage. Then there's the breast milk jaundice, and that will be seen at seven days, and it peaks at 10 days. And they think this is attributed to um, a factor in human milk that increases the intestinal um, absorption. But you know, if it's this, if this is the cause, then there's really nothing you can do. There's no interventions that are needed. Um, gastrointestinal adaptation. Uh, so. Um, peristalsis will occur and the baby should have that meconium stool past the first 8 to 24 hours of life. It's going to be like a greenish black color. So the kidney function. Um, so a baby's bladder capacity is 6 to 44 mLs, so pretty tiny. Um, they need to have 60 to 80 milliliters of fluid per kilogram. And their normal output should be one to three um, milliliters per kilogram per hour. So you want to make sure that you're really monitoring their INO and looking at their urine. 
Um, we encourage moms to um, count wet diapers and count the stools. Um, a lot of hospitals have those little charts that the moms can just put a little X in. Um, so their immune system, they'll get the active acquired immunity and we've talked about that before. So this is all the um, things that mom is immune to, um, she will pass them on to baby. And then there's the passive acquired immunity and this is through the placenta. And then the um, immunoglobulins, that's IgG, IgA, and IgM will provide that humoral immunity. Psychosocial adaptations. So the early stages of activity. First, they're going to have that period of reactivity. So they're going to be alert right away after birth, kind of wondering what's going on. And then 30 minutes to two hours after birth, they're going to get tired. They, you know, they want to sleep. And so then they're going to have that period of inactivity. And then they'll sleep for a while. And then they'll get up again. And then usually they'll want some food. They'll be crying. Um, behavioral states. So um, babies have this sleep alert cycle. So during their sleep cycle, um, they will, um, they do have REM cycles. And then their alert stage. This is when they're um, wide awake, they're active, they're crying, 